next door. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a real experiment to set this up. We have never done this before. We've never done Facebook Live before. Two of us don't even have Facebook accounts. So this is a real experiment. And we're so, so grateful for you guys joining us. I know some of you have woken up really early to join us today. So we're so grateful for that. So thank you so much. We wanted to have this live event today, Sarah, Rasan, and myself, because this year we've had so much time to really reflect and talk about things that we've never really had time to talk about. We've talked about conservation, we've spoken about conservation in a different way, and new thoughts and new new um, insights keep coming up. And we've had so many discussions amongst the three of us that we thought this time let's actually bring it out into the public and have you hear about some of these discussions where we've been having and also hear from you. We'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. We've just figured out the comments uh, sidebar so we can definitely see what you're sending us. So please keep those going and please do ask us questions at the end. We often, when we're giving presentations or talks, we always talk, talk about the direct threats to lions or wildlife or the threats to conservation, but there's so many things that go undiscussed and they're things that are related to conservation but are not things that we can you know solve or fix this very day or tomorrow or you know this year in fact so that is some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today we're going to be talking about some of the things that are not easy to figure out but those discussions must be had so we hope this is just the beginning this we hope might even be a series we're going to see how it goes we'd love to hear from you about that. So thank you so much for joining us. I can see our great friends at the Grevy Zebra Trust have just joined us down, down the road from their camp. So thank you all and I'll hand over to Sarah. Thank you, Rasan. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> we're sorry. I'm sorry, we're sorry. You see, we're still practicing yeah, this. We're, 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 we're feeling our way through this. So, um, you know, after that wonderful in in introduction, we, we've called this a bold discussion. And I think one of the reasons why um, we, we've called a bold discussion is because, as Shivani said, a lot of these topics are not spoken about. And maybe part of the reason is that they it's easy for them to fly under the radar. And another part is that when they are spoken about, they're spoken about with a lot of emotion. And we understand and we don't want ever to diminish the kind of emotions that these topics elicit. But at the same time, we want to have empathy for people who are in different areas in the spectrum. And we also acknowledge that we all are on at different phases in this spectrum. But we want to speak truth and we want to speak courageously. So our two values uh, that we always bring to this discussion are empathy and kindness. And that's generally the tone that we want to set for the whole um, hour that we're going to be talking and also for the questions that we hope that you ask, um, it, it, this is not a combative thing. This is something about us working together to figure it out because I don't think anybody else has figured it out. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Rasan. And I think by way of further introduction to the three of us, um, we decided to do something a little bit different and introduce ourselves um, with three sentences that describes ourselves in terms of nuanced identity. So. And all of us have dualities in terms of our identities. We can be sad, but also hopeful and also hopeful at the same time. So we really want to point to ourselves as layered and um, layered beings. We have layered identities. We can't sit here and represent the voices of, for example, myself. I can't represent um, the voices of a white South African. Um, Shivani can't represent the voices of the Indian community in Kenya um, in the same way that Rasan can't can't. Um, essentialize the voices of a black Kenyan a, and a young young conservation practitioner at that. So um, I'm going to hand over to Shivani to start us out with those three sentences. So my three sentences are, I am brown and I am African. I am a Kenyan of Indian origin and I'm not a business person. I am passionate about cricket and I support South Africa. Okay, I'm going to see if I remember my three sentences. So um, I am an urban Kenyan 
and Samburu is my second home. I am a proud Maasai, but I don't speak Ma. I am the biggest fan of Saudi Soul, our amazing African stars um, and musicians, but I and I also can sing every single word to every ABBA song that you can think of. <laughs> and I'm white and I'm African. I'm from Durban and I've lived in Kenya for nearly eight years. I studied urban studies and I work as a conservation practitioner. So what does this mean? I mean, why have we done this? We've done this because, well, one, to give you a couple of insights into who we are, but also there's so many assumptions that are made about us just by looking at us, just by hearing us. And these are the things we want to discuss. So for example, my three, my three little, little statements. I, you know, a lot of people over the many years I've been living and working here for so long, a lot of people say, oh, but you should just go back to India. Or why are you looking after lions in Kenya? Go back to India. Or aren't you from Oxford? Well, how long are you here for? Um, another assumption is, well, if you are Kenyan, so I assume, well, Kenyan of Indian origin, we assume you're supporting the Indian cricket team. And for any of you passionate cricket fans out there, I'm sorry to say, but India is the last country I support in cricket. Well, second last country. And I do support South Africa because, well, Kenya's cricket team isn't that good, let's be honest. And for me, the next best, because I am African, is this amazing South African team that I have followed since I was a child. So that's just a couple of examples about some of the assumptions that are made if someone looks at me or someone hears me, hears my accent, where I'm from, what I do. Yeah, we're going to talk about a lot of these assumptions. And I think they're made, you know, when I think about myself, um, the things that I I cringe about or the things that I feel like I have to over explain um, just to make other people comfortable. Um, okay, so this person, where does she where, where does she really come from? Where does she really fit? She doesn't speak Ma, but she works there. So is she, you know, is she authentic? Like you, it's, it's this constant battle in trying to prove my authenticity as a person and as, you know, as, as, a, as a conservation person. Um, and just to prove that I belong here. And sometimes it's even me who spends time negating that um, and, and, and believes that I should be put aside in some way. Um, so it's, we, we need to keep having these discussions because I'm pretty sure some of you listening on the other side, if you are in the conservation world, feel that, feel that sometimes you've had to negate bits about yourself. And I don't know if it happens in other fields, but hmm. yeah, we hmm. need to- yeah, interesting <laughs> question to pose. Yeah, I think I'm I'm obviously South African, but I've lived in, in East Africa for the last eight years in Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania. And I think my experiences across the four African countries that I've lived in have all been different in terms of the assumptions that are made about my origins. So in South Africa, it's widely accepted that I'm South African and I'm African. And I think because of the demographic there. Um, in Kenya, I've, for example, been laughed at pu for putting my hand up in a vote for Africans in a boardroom. Um, it has been assumed oftentimes that I'm American or Irish because of the color of my hair. And I think, I think on a day to day basis in Kenya, I think there are many assumptions made about my, my origins. And as, as Rasan says, it's, it's easy to, to try and negate those parts of yourself so that you feel like you have a place in the conservation sector in Kenya. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we'll, we'll leave that there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've talked about our identities and our struggles of just being. But then we want to ask another question about, you know, how that fits in with this discussion, which is then considering all our complexities, are we conservationists? Um, and to be honest, I struggle with, I've, I've struggled a lot with this word. Um, I, I've had some very visceral reactions to it recently because and a, 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 a good friend, Mudoni Drama Queen, um, in, in a symposium we held a few weeks, a few months ago, talked about this, what this word invokes. And, and it really resonated with me. It, res it's, it, it has a, um, a connotation that it is my job 
as a conservationist to conserve all the natural resources and it's nobody else's job it's just me um and just us just just those of us with i don't know certain things that we've done in our lives um and it also has this separation from other people that even the resources itself the resources themselves are separated um from people so i think those two things um mudoni described it as as we are like prison wardens um you know guarding some resource something that 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 needs to stay behind whatever the bars that we've put and i i hate that because conservation this is not what i signed up for i don't think this is what anybody signed up for um and yet it's it's kind of widely accepted that you know we are the the people and and that we we are then idolized and 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 the one person is put up there um maybe shivani you want to yeah. carry on with that <laughs> i mean i think that's what makes it challenging is when you look at i mean we'll speak really just about the conservation you know profession when you look at conservation projects you see that one person that what they call the hero who is out there saving wildlife or saving something and it's something i personally have really struggled with for so many years i didn't start iwaso lions many years ago for me i it it was not something that i thought well this is for me and i'm going to be that face and i'm going to be the hero and all that but over time that's what you keep hearing we hear it from our friends and supporters and and organizations and media especially they put a lot of pressure saying we want that one person you know the leader and rasan explains it quite well it's the like the the pinnacle, the, pinnacle the, the, one at the, the one at the top and you know people expect just to see that that one person and there's something so fundamentally wrong in this conservation and what we do it's not about me it's not one person it's an amazing team which doesn't have this pinnacle thing and there was many years ago about 15 years ago someone said to me shivani get used to it you will be the face of iwaso lions and you are you know you will be the one out there because that's the way it is if you look at other conservation projects you always get that one face person and if you look at some of our most inspirational speakers about who speak about conservation some of them are in their 80s and 90s talking about conservation and don't get me wrong they're amazing they're inspiring but where are the people next to them who are going to take this forward that is really lacking in conservation and it's something that when that person told me that 15 years ago i was so upset and first of all i didn't really like that person very much and i was like i'm going to prove you wrong because that's you might think that is the norm that this is how conservation is that you look up to this one model hero sort of person but we can do it differently and we are working so hard as our project to really change that to have to not have that hierarchy we have the most amazing team and this so much injustice when you put pressure on that one person demanding to see one person wanting to film them wanting to only talk to them about funding we are a team and we're all in this together and it's that one face model that can be very detrimental to moving forward in conservation so i think i think the question then that comes out of this this conversation is do we do away with the word conservationist is it useful and meaningful obviously it has a dictionary meaning but have we gone so far from that dictionary meaning in terms of the connotations around it that it's no longer useful and so there there may be some alternatives and I'll talk about that in a second and, you know we don't often agree on this you know <laughs> yeah. we've had been having this discussion for a while now yeah and i still think the word conservation should be conservationist should be there because the reality is there's still too much to conserve i mean we're really going battling against a losing battle in a way and we have to be conservationist to conserve what's disappearing yeah. so quickly so we we also don't agree on yeah. this but i think this is the beginning of discussions yeah. to see yeah. what we can do and yeah. we'd like to hear you know what what your thoughts are and you know i mean i think that we need to redefine the word i think that it needs to be a lot broader and i i i use the example of the fact that in so many african languages there is no mm. actual word for conservation or for conservationist um 
you know, it's con conservation was part of everything. It was part mm -hmm. of the culture. It was part of spirituality. It was part of just how you work and take care of the of the land. And you know, even even the even the Kiswahili word is like a very clunky word. Kuhifadi uh, wanyama wapori. Like it, it's it, to save the the and uh, the wild. It's just. It's like somebody came and tried to create a transliteration rather than something that that existed, and um, I think that conservation is so much more. You know, it's it's about our cultures, it's about our the landscape and the wildlife and us. It's about our spirituality, and I think you know, moving forward. Um, Oh, it just said, um, um, Margie okay. said, can't hear. Okay, I hope you can hear me better now. Well, I'm sure that comment came a minute ago, <laughs> but I hope you can hear. Yeah, I hope that you can hear um, me better. That um, it's it's really, it really has to encompass more. And, you know, in our, in the 21st century, with all the innovation that has gone into things, with all of our our ideological thinking changing and growing, how does conservation grow and how does it fit um and and then how do, what is a conservationist if you put all those things into a fruit salad what 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 is that is it is it is it conservationist still or is it something else i don't know yeah. so i think I think if we think about the word conservationist and look at that suffix and um, i s t it actually donates someone who comes from a particular doctrinal point of view. And so I think the question we can pose to ourselves is, are we all coming from the same conservation doctrine? Are we all approaching conservation with the same philosophy? And I think the question, the, the answer is no. Just between the three of us, I think we all have nuances to our conservation philosophies. And so my proposal will be, um, given that we're talking about narratives and, and we're trying to be pragmatic here, is that we think about words like practitioner, so conservation practitioner, or landscape steward, or biodiversity steward, um, biodiversity managers, because we're all, we're all biodiversity managers, no matter where we are, whether we're sitting in a city, or near a lake, or here in Sambu. And so I think, I think those are just some su suggestions to throw out there. And the reason why I like the term practitioner is because I think it encompasses various ways for people to practice conservation. And I think, I think the point of this conversation is that we need to move to a really inclusive point where the, the narratives that we use can accommodate all and all of our differences. So with that in mind, we have to ask, what is the actual profile of an African conservationist? And I think it's, it's such an important question um, because we have to, you know, we, it's, it's very easy to think about doing away with something, but thinking about, oh, somebody says guardians of nature. That's a very wow. interesting, um, interesting one. Conservationists are force gatherers for the environment and community. Right. Huh. Wow. Your, your oh, comments are really amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, when we think about what a, what a, an African conservationist looks like, I'm pretty sure for all of you listening right now, there's an image that pops up. What is that image and how can we define it in the way that we, 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 are, we want? Um, I think um, there's so many categories of things that we'd like to talk about under this. Um, and maybe we start with the fact that very often when you look at, a, when you think of a conservation, when that image pops into your mind, you think uh, very highly educated, highly skilled. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been thinking and talking about this a lot recently. A couple of weeks ago, Jenneria came to me and we were having a chat just here. And he said, you know, we keep talking about wanting to make people conservationists or become conservationists. And he's like, it, it doesn't even make sense here because we have lived here. We live here. We've lived with wildlife forever. We've always been conservationists. But when you think of a conservationist, do you think of that community member in his or her village? And he was saying, how come we're always talking about making people conservationists when people are already conservationists? And it really got me thinking about, you know, levels of education. As Rasan said, you think about the most skilled, educated person. Our team 
probably 90% of them have, have not been to school. They've been to, you know, some of them might have done limited uh, primary education. And yet they are the most incredible, impactful conservationists. And so really it gets you thinking about the, you know, education and how important it is to do conservation. And I'll give you my own personal story here. I seem to have received a lot of bad advice in my life, but about 20 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago, I can't remember, someone said, Shivani, if you want Iwaso Lions to be successful, receive funding, people to take you seriously, you need a PhD. And I was shocked because I thought, well, PhD surely is for someone who's really academic and a real scientist, someone who loves science and someone who's a really good researcher. And I'm not any of these. I'm a terrible scientist. I'm really not academic at all. <laughs> but I took that advice and I thought, goodness, I better now do a PhD. And I did, but it took me a really long time. It took me over 10 years. And the reason it took me really long is because one, I was busy doing stuff. I was busy on the ground, actually doing conservation. I wasn't in university taking classes that wouldn't help me at all. Secondly, I feel that, you know, I, 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 I kept thinking, I'm like, my heart's not really in it. I, I feel like this is, my heart is here, you know, going out with the guys doing something and my heart's not in this academics, in this academia. Long story short, 10 years passes. And in those 10 years, even before I had a PhD, Iwaso Lions was receiving funding. People were taking us seriously. And it was a successful organization. It is a sex successful organization that's having impact. And it all happened without a PhD. And I'm not saying I regret my PhD because I absolutely don't. I, I think, you know, well, one, it was a great experience, not something I'd ever want to repeat. But if there's any students out here who are listening to this and who are being told that to do conservation, you must have a PhD, I'd like you to just think again and to really reflect on why you want to do that PhD. Is that PhD because you're a real scientist, you really want to understand something, you are a real academic, then go for it. But if it's because someone told you, you will never do anything in conservation without a PhD, argue that yeah. because that's just not true. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little bit about, you know, how education has defined what the image of a conservationist. Mm -hmm. and I just wanted to to just plus one on that and just say one more thing that for as long as people define a conservationist by that the formal education standards because people here are very highly educated but just not in the way that you know um, we are expected people are expected to be educated in the conservation world but for as long as that formal education remains a barrier then communities who have been conservationists forever will continually be the object of transformation for all the things or all the, all the sort of conservation work that needs to be done. They will always be the villains. They'll always be, oh, I think because of these people who are not educated, um, they don't know this and therefore they are doing bad things. And so we need to work out how to change them, how to grow them, how to do this. But the community are the conservationists and we need to start saying that more so that the object of transformation isn't them anymore. And if I could just add to Shivani's point about the type of qualification and, and that being PhDs being, being promoted, for example. Um, I think it's also important that we have multi, a multidisciplinary approach to the sector. We've got so many threats um, to our landscapes um, in terms of legal frameworks in terms of infrastructure development, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so we need a constituency of conservation practitioners who come from various backgrounds. And if I can just speak to my own experience, I have a master's in urban studies. And I remember about 10 years ago doing interviews and people's eye eyebrows being raised when I say that I've got a master's in urban studies. They really had an expectation that I had a master's in ecology or biology. And that's a really important thing to have in the sector. But but the strengths that I bring are perspectives on the connections between um, 
the where our natural resources sit and our cities and the dynamics the dynamics between those places and so i think in addition to Shivani's encouragement to challenge the idea that you might need to do a PhD, I would really look at your interests and make sure you follow those interests to a discipline or a, um, an area of study that really fits your fits your interests. Run with that and you will definitely find an angle to contribute to conservation in a way that is unique. Mm. Absolutely. And is the profile of an African conservationist female? <laughs> when you think of it like the three of us sitting here this is it is us unusual <laughs> i mean the reality is women in leadership conservation positions in africa there's very few i think it's something like five percent of african women are in conservation leadership positions there's so many women who stay in the same spot for 20 years and watch men shoot above them or someone from out of Africa come and take over a position that they should have got. And this is a problem. We are facing this problem in Africa and this has to change, but we can't change this alone. This is something we've got to do together. And I mean, there's some fantastic initiatives out there. For example, a new one, Women for the Environment, We Africa, again, bringing up women in leadership positions to, to really give them that confidence and coaching they need to rise up in those ranks that they're just not given. So it is, it is a problem in Africa is the gender, the gender imbalance in conservation. But it's something we all really need to work on together. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's, this is rare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's been so many panels this year, especially during this time of COVID, where everything has become virtual. And if you look at most of these conservation panels that have been advertised, this majority men. And we said, we are refusing to be on a panel with less than, less than was it 50% women. We just absolutely refused because things have to change on that. Yeah. And and if I can just say it, that's not that's not a token request. That's not requesting equality on a panel for the sake of it. That's because women from diverse backgrounds bring diverse perspectives, bring different kinds of solutions. And I think it's important that we recognize the pragmatic importance of diversity in conversations such as this. And um, the other thing I wanted to say on the topic of gender is that um, leadership decisions around um, experiences that women have in conservation are really important. So if I can speak to a personal experience of mine, I was in an East African country a few years ago and I had a sense that the men in the car behind, in, in the back seat were actually talking about marrying me off in the local community. And I didn't feel I could raise that at the time and I'm, I'm raising it now in a public forum, and um, that I think, I think if that had been addressed at the time with some of my colleagues, um, I, think, I think we would have gone one step further. And I think women's experiences in conservation or negative experiences in conservation in terms of their gendered experience mm -hmm. is, an, a, is an accumulative issue. And so if we can address things at each step, mm -hmm. um, we might have a better chance at creating a more inclusive, inclusive sector. Mm -hmm. And it's all these microaggressions, all of these simple things like um, you're expected to be the one to take the notes at the meeting. Um, you are immediately expected to care for the people who have come for a meeting uh, and, you know, bring them tea and be that person. You are never the person who is uh, looked at um, in terms of having experience and having something important to bring to the table. Um, and we have to push back. We have to constantly push back at these things. Um, you know, I think very many African societies are patriarchal, um, but there is an awareness as we are in the 21st century that there's a problem with this, that, that this skew is actually detrimental. Um, and and we, have to, we have to work at it. And that means that we need male allies. So we're really happy for all the men who are listening <laughs> to us right now. Um, I want to move on to, to a new thing, which is often the elephant in the room. We, are, we still haven't figured out why that t phrase exists. <laughs> but elephant in the room. We just discussed it. We're like, where did this term come from? <laughs> elephant in the room. But that's a conversation. For another day. day. But... It is that very often if you think about that profile of a conservationist, they are 
probably pale and male. We giggle about it a lot, but it is it is the truth. And you know, with the colonial underpinnings of conservation, that has been ubiquitous. It's all over. And I think today I was really reminded that these racial issues have a face. Um, they have a face and they have a cost. They have personal costs to so many of us who, um, you know, so many stories have happened, have, have, have been told to me about, you know, the pay disparities that that black versus any one else um, um, uh, uh, people working in the conservation field um, experience um, that you you can always train and even ha get qualifications um, to, 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 to rise to be, you know, in, in these echelons, but you will never actually get there. That you may be an incredible conservationist, but you are always looking for looking to see somebody else take over because you're not the right color. We see this all the time. And I think we have been trained in very many ways to be very quiet about it mm -hmm. and to talk about it only in, you know, in closed doors. But that sort of thing, this thing that is always happening is so detrimental. It's so demoralizing that so many people who are incredible have fallen away or continue to work in the field, but will never, but, but because they know that they'll never be the they'll never take the their rightful position as the leader of of an organization for example there there is an apathy that that develops um and it's such a painful personal cost mm. and then there is also the the cost to everything else that if then conservation can never have you know black leadership as it were african leadership as it were then how then does how then are things solved actually out in the field? How then does that happen? Um, and then you'll find people saying then that that this is not our our thing. This this is this is an outsider's job. He kaziniya wazungu is what is what um, is often said in Kenya, and that has a cost to actual conservation. Um, yes. I think, you know, related to that, we have a great friend who works in Sri Lanka and she came up with this term called parachute science. Her name is Asha DeVos. And it's something we really believe in. What There was a, a paper she wrote that came out this year. And what makes what Rasan just said, Hio Kazini Awazungu, so like something that we have seen and heard so much is this whole concept of parachute science. And that's that term where people come in from the outside, come and do some work and then leave again. And it's, it's not, a, a, it's not people who are there to stay. It's not people who are there to really work with people for, you know, the future. It's you pop in, do a little bit of research and then pop, pop out again. And that parachute science is, has got to change but it's so ingrained in so much of what we see and do just for example we've been filling out some grant applications this week and some of the questions are horrendous it's questions like do you need a visa or you know what what permits do you need for hiring a car or whatever it's very much written for someone from the outside to apply for funding to come and work in our countries who is your local collaborator, who is your local collaborator? I, and i'm just like who is the, the local who is the principal investigator and you know what is the name of your field-based project or whatever it is and it just it sort of really it frustrates us because we should be encouraging our own citizens and our communities to apply for funding. Yet some of these grant applications make it quite difficult. And so we get that. We also, I mean, I, this is going back a long time. I used to work um, many years ago at the Kenya Wildlife Service, which is my introduction into conservation. And one of my responsibilities there was I used to give lectures to university students about, you know, getting involved in conservation. And there was one question I was always asked. And it was, but should, isn't this just a hobby? Or should we just do it for weekends? Or should we, you know, we watch all these documentaries and it's some presenter from somewhere else. Should we just, you know, do conservation for a weekend and then do a serious job? 
and there's all these perceptions about what it is we actually do, and it comes from so much the media, the funding organizations, and I think this is really what has to change. I mean, we we we've, we've been. We've been laughing a lot. You know, you heard from Sarah and Rasan earlier about tra- changing, trying to change this word of conservationist. There's another word that we're really struggling with, and that's in the field. And <laughs> I, I think we all have different things to say about that. But I've stopped saying it because it doesn't make any sense to me. I live there. There's my tent right up here, and I don't go into the field. I live here and I work here, and I know working from home has been a new thing for everyone this year because of COVID. But for me, it's what I've done for decades, and so this whole concept of going in the field, you know, where it comes from. I think Sarah will talk more about that, but it's it's something that we really want to change because it it's not going into the field, and you know, especially I mean, for our our team who, whose villages are here. So that's something else we've really been having discussions about. I'll let Sarah and Rasan say more. So we did a little bit of digging in terms of the roots of that term in the field, and and we found that it, it seems to come from um, 18th or 19th century British cartographers who essentially went to new places to map out those places. And so really, it's come from a very objective place in terms of mapping out the 2D reality of a topographic, topographical landscape. Um, whereas by contrast, we live really subjective realities here, um, in doing the work that we do. As, as we, by way of introduction, we showed you that we have really nuanced backgrounds and we have, um, varied perspectives on, on how to do this work. We have relationships with people in, in, in the places that we work, whether it be in cities or here in Sambu. So I think, I think we need to think a lot more about this term and how it's used because narratives matter. And this is the point of this conversation we're having. And, and, and so how do we frame that alternatively? What are the alternatives? I mean, and Sarah's example of offices in Nairobi. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was saying that saying in the field is as ludicrous as my saying in the conservation field and um, saying I'm going into government offices. Therefore, I'm going into the field today. And so why, why don't we interrogate this more? And and something else I was going to say earlier about interrogation is that I think we need to be interrogating all of these narratives more often. Mm -hmm. So in terms of race, privilege and power, when when issues come up, why is it that we don't feel comfortable to interrogate Mm -hmm. that and be open and honest? And whether it be with a funder, whether it be with a colleague, um, because I think when we have those honest conversations at, at more regular intervals, we break down the barriers that stop us from interrogating mm-hmm. and challenging these concepts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so what what are the alternatives? So for me, I think Shivani's is the funniest, but I'll go first anyway. Um, you know, Samburu for, for a decade has been my second home. So I could say that, but I realized that in, in many ways, I should actually name the place. I should name that I'm going to northern Kenya, to Samburu, to wherever I'm going, because this is also someone's actual permanent home. It is Shivani's home. It is all the people who are around us home. People, th- this, this is their identity. And me saying I'm going to some amorphous place with, you know, some boundaries that apparently I've defined also disenfranchises them in some way. So I think... You know, these are discussions, we're literally having them now. They're literally as fluid as this. And we are African conservationists, you know, working out what that, uh, conservation practitioners working out what that means. Um, So even today we're slipping up, like, I'm going to say in the field, no, it's not in the field. It's like, what is it? (laughs) Because it's so deep. Yes, yeah. I mean, and just uh, again, just to wrap this up before we move on to the next topic, you know, a lot of people say we we want to visit the Iwaso Lions field camp or, you know, your office or the research center, the research base. And we've really struggled with that. I mean, this is home. This is home for so many of us. And we don't have a research base. And, you know, we, we had someone who sent us a message yesterday saying, we're coming to visit you. And we were like, no, you're not. <laughs> For a couple of reasons. One is 
you know, we, this is home. You, you, we don't just normally march into people's homes anywhere in the world. Secondly, obviously, this is times of COVID and we have strict COVID protocols in camp. So no, you can't just walk into here and there is no research base. Literally, you'll see a bunch of tents. So again, you know, we're really trying to communicate this and try and somehow change the narrative. But as Sarah said, it's so ingrained. Shivani is working from home. <laughs> I'm, I'm working from home. I'm going to keep saying that now. It's it's sort of, yes, now that has to become ingrained in me. I cannot keep saying I'm going into the field because that makes zero sense. And I'm, I'm loving the comments that are coming up as well. <laughs> Something else about, you know, sort of the profile of, of a conservationist is, is age. You know, you sort of expect an older, you know, you have this image of someone older in conservation and you think, you know, you need to be a much older person to be involved in conservation. And growing up, I definitely was made to feel that way, that no one is, you know, you're not a conservationist until you're, you know, a certain age. And, you know, I want to give you an example of our team here. We always hear about how the children are the next generation. They, they will be conservationists in the future. And it, it's something that, again, we want to try and change people's way of thinking that children are not the next generation of conservationists, but a new generation. And some of you, you know, some of you we who are chatting here, we can see your comments. You know our team and you might know Junior. Junior was only nine years old when he spent time with us and our team. And at the end, he was part of our Lion Kids Camp, a five day program where kids come and spend and hang out with us. And he said, I want to be just like Jenneria. I want to run around and look for lions and I'll spend every weekend and every holiday with you. And we didn't believe him. We thought, ah, oh, he kijana, you know, he's, he's not very serious about that, but he has. Over the last, I mean, he's almost 17 now. Junior has spent every weekend and every holiday with us. And not only was he a conservationist, you know, he's been one forever, but he's training a new generation. He's now, as I'm speaking, he is out in our bush bus with a bunch of children talking to them about lions. And he's been doing that all week and he'll show up this evening and he'll wake up at four o'clock tomorrow morning and keep going. Cassian, another fantastic example, who was a boy involved in our lion kids camp and now he's a warrior and he's been a conservationist forever. So age really, what does it really mean? And, and, and we should stop saying children are the future. We should really be working and encouraging children to really get on with it because i mean let's face it you all know this time is running out we've got to get on with it and we've got to be talking and thinking it comes back to that whole one face model who will take this forward you know we've got to make this sustainable we are here to stay but who will take this forward so again the importance of working with children at no matter what age and if I can just add to that in terms of my specific involvement in the infrastructure sector. And um, so I work for um, both the Wasi Lions and Gravy Zebra Trust in the infrastructure and biodiversity program. And so I'm involved in a lot of environmental um, regulatory processes, including public hearings for specific projects. And um, a few years ago, I attended a public hearing and a little girl about the age of about 10, she had written three lines in response to this specific project. And so she got up to speak at the public hearing in front of maybe a few hundred people and the person in charge essentially intercepted her and then made a statement to the public there about the fact that children are comparable to drunkards in these kinds of forums and therefore their what they have to say is not valid in that kind of forum and I think that really really highlights the the contempt in certain institutions and in certain places for the opinions of children and I think because they speak truth to power mm -hmm. often and that's what that's what an older generation um, is afraid of sometimes because they actually have the right answers they have the innovation that we're all looking for and I think when we think about some someone like Greta Thunberg who's actually received a lot of backlash and criticism mm -hmm. I think it's because people realize that she is speaking truth to power mm -hmm. she is she is a figure for change and she's not ashamed of it um, and that is not to say that there isn't a place for the older generation. That isn't isn't to say that there's a sell by date for a conservationist. Um, it's basically to say that we all at all ages 
are valid and should be working together and should be if we're older passing on you know as 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 Shivani said junior is only 17 and he's already passing on what he knows to 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 younger kids we should be passing on and others should be should be imparting on us and but we but it's not just about imparting for the future it's about imparting for the now because things are happening now so you know it's it's really about about having all of us and having proper intergenerational leadership um I, i'm going to just say one thing that is a funny thing and we, we we were caught on camera talking about it earlier which is that sometimes some the profile of a conservationist also depends on how you dress apparently and i mean i think about how many conservationists i've seen having to wear khaki shorts in nairobi or feeling like they have to and i feel very uncomfortable sometimes attending meetings because i often want to look smart but then when i think that i can look smart i then look overly smart for this meeting because apparently all conservationists are field conservationists <laughs> and must always look like you are field ready which i think is hilarious but it's become such a given that i you then don't know how you don't understand your place as a conservationist in living in an an and an urban an urbanite conservationist like myself um well so actually we've had a great question here from Pat which is really going to lead us nicely into the next segue about how to demystify conservation so more Kenyans feel that they can be involved in conservation so I'm actually going to hand straight back to Rasan to really talk about this because it's very much what we were going to you know sort of wrap up this session about um I don't know if it's the wrapping up or if it's actually <laughs> diving the into next the segment. next topic yeah. um because it brings up you know we we've gone down one layer you know conservation a lot of the time you're expected to talk about the threats you expect to talk about human wildlife conflict and you're expected to talk about you know just those top level things but these things that we've just spoken about really underpin who a conservationist is and therefore what we can actually accomplish out here but a lot of that is then underpinned by something else in africa which is that africa's conservation history is colonial or has been was colonial that the people who came to deal with conservation their mission at the onset um whether well meaning or not was to separate africans from wildlife um and i think this year more than ever we we're, we're really talking about really defining a what conservation is but also talking about how to change these narratives and how to decolonize and i think you many of you have probably heard the term decolonize a lot this year but we want to define it in the way that we have understood it so that this makes sense and this this that relates directly to kenyans and how to get kenyans more involved in conservation you know a lot of people just think oh just do a lot of programs and the thing is over decades so many programs have been done and very and very often they haven't been successful because conservation is still considered fringe because of its colonial roots so let's define conservation uh, yeah so we to colonize yeah so we thought a little bit about this and and one definition that we really liked um was that to colonize is to appropriate a place or domain for one's own use and the reason we like that definition is because we think it encompasses a lot of different forms of what it means to colonize and i think we'd all agree we have we have various forms of neo colonization at the moment in this world and and in kenya and so for example there there are very dimensions of of colonization so we have um we have racial a racial form of colonization um still ongoing we have organizational colonization where specific organizations have a stake in a specific landscape and won't work with other partners in that landscape and um, we have thematic colonization and we're going to speak a little bit about and um, the tourism sector for example and and the implications of the tourism sector for um colonization of the conservation agenda and so yeah i think i think i'll leave it there and yeah. and hand it over 
Yeah, there are so many facets to this con- con- conversation about um, co- colonization. And I think for a lot of people, you know, I'm glad, you know, we've kind of tackled a lot of the race and privilege and power um, dynamics there. But we, we also want to tackle the things that are kind of unseen. So we've spoken quite a bit about how tourism can be a colonizing agent of conser- of conservation. And I think probably a lot of people thought that, um, and this is where empathy and courage come in, you know, we're not saying that tourists are colonizers. <laughs> we are saying that tourism has the power to be a colonizing agent. So the landscape we are looking out at right now um, is a multi-use multifaceted landscape you know it is used by pastoralists it is used by all sorts of people it is used by wildlife it is used by tourists it is used by county professionals for various other things it is used as a place to 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 live but for a lot of people thinking about conservation um, they have immediately tied conservation to tourism, married them and in some ways anchored conservation to tourism in a, in a very detrimental way. And this has colonial underpinnings. So we had a discussion with Judy Kefagona um, some months ago about this. And she spoke about how, you know, at the turn of, of the last century, when people were exploring this continent, they were escaping their industrial revolution and the pollution of their cities and and the awfulness that was happening where they were and coming into these beautiful amazing landscapes which people say are pristine they were very multi-use even back then and they basically imposed their view of wilderness and what conservation should be and it was a very recreational thing for them so they married those two, conservation and recreation, and basically said, and, and we have basically never reimagined that. So it's about having the discussion about reimagining um, conservation separate from tourism and then having that discussion with the tourism sector about how to re-merge the, the two. Um, this landscape cannot only be used for tourism, should not only be used for tourism. Um, and I think it ha- you know, just trying to do that has been very detrimental in Africa. I mean, yeah, this this year, obviously, it, it's been such a tough year because tourism has collapsed everywhere. And a question we are asked a lot is, well, how is it impacted, you know, conservation or, you know, bushmeat snaring or, you know, basically wildlife generally in, in your area or in Kenya? And what this year has highlighted, especially for Northern Kenya, is the resilience of pastoralism. And pastoralists here have, you know, not not everyone is employed in tourist lodges. We work in such a big landscape, probably about 70, 80 percent of the areas we work in have no tourism at all. And the communities in those areas have just continued with their way of life. Obviously, one thing that has made a big difference is the fact that there's so much grass still because we we have had quite a lot of rain in the last couple of years. And as long as there's enough grass, that resilience of pastoralism continues. And for so long, there's so much pressure to change pastoralism and to modernize it and to commodify it and, you know, to change this culture and this way of life. But actually, it should be supported because look at this year, the, 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 the way of life has continued. And I'm not saying this is the case everywhere. Southern Kenya, yes, it has struggled because there is such a dependence on tourism to fund conservation, to you know, to basically keep so many areas with wildlife going. And of course, they have been, they have struggled. But I think what this year has highlighted is support pastoralism, highlight it because it's so resilient and this has shown it. It's a, it's a culture that is not dependent on tourism, especially up here in Northern Kenya. Yeah, so I think I think in closing, we really want to speak about the future of our landscapes in terms of African conservation leadership and what that looks like. And one of the key pieces that's come to our minds is that 
the future is inclusive. It has to be inclusive in order in order for us to achieve the kind of conservation gains that we want to. And so the question is, how do we go about securing that inclusive future? And I have a few insights from the sector in which I work, which is, again, the infrastructure sector and trying to mainstream biodiversity into that sector. And I think some of the, the takeaways are that I think we, we attempt to, to create participation participatory processes as tick box exercises. And instead of doing that, I think we need to put far more of our energy towards relationship building, partnership creation, um, in order to build that community of practice on top of which we can then make decisions. I think we come to points of key decision making without those key relationships in place within a landscape. And then we're suddenly scrambling. There's a lot of tension often around key decisions. And instead of going about our daily daily work, we need to actually put aside money, I would say, mm -hmm. towards partnership creation and relationship building so that we have a, a sense of who the landscape stakeholders are, of who the landscape owners are, and of who the landscape partners are, so that we're not starting from scratch every time we need to make a key decision about biodiversity. And, and, I, and I think in closing, I think we, we all feel African conservation um, should be African-led and owned. And I think we need to have really strong partnerships um, internationally around that African-owned owned agenda um, so that we can have sustainable landscapes going forward. Okay. Absolutely. Um, Thank you all so much for being here and for being so patient. We have gone over time. We wanted some time to answer any questions you may have. So feel free to jot them down at the side. We will we'll come see. in front yeah. and squint to try and read the questions. Um, but something else we want to hear from you is, oh, sorry. <laughs> something else we want to hear from you is, you know, do you find these type of conversations interesting? Is it something you'd like to hear more of? And is it something, you know, new that you might have heard? Uh, especially this year, I'm sure so many of you have been on lots of Zooms and virtual webinars and everything. Is this the type of thing you'd like to hear more of? Because then it'll, it'll help us also decide um, whether we do more of this. Mm -hmm. For us, it was really important to to tell you about some of what we've been discussing this year. And we hope you found it interesting. But we're very happy to take any questions you guys might have. Um, we were going to end in about three minutes time, but we are happy to even stay on a bit more. And um, so, yeah, feel free to feel free to ask us anything. I think Sarah's done a quick scroll. Yeah, we've largely got comments. Largely Wait, comments. Any specific, yeah. questions, any specific questions, please feel free to ask. I know Pat had a question about how to get more Kenyans involved in conservation. Something we're so passionate about, Pat, and hopefully, you know, hopefully at all levels, we can really just inspire and encourage Kenyans to get on board. We have an amazing new program actually that we started a couple of months ago. I'll let Rasan speak about it, but it's about exactly that, bringing, you know, conservation to Kenyans in a far more, um, uh, what's the word? Um, practical practical yeah. way. Yeah. So let Rasan, as hopefully you guys can send us a couple more questions, but yeah. Rasan will tell you a little bit about the new program Beyond Boundaries. Well, um, you're in it at the moment. Yes, you <laughs> because, are in it. <laughs> because, you know, this is about crafting a new decolonized conservation space. Our, our, our program is called Beyond Boundaries KE. And we realize that we we have to, you know, somebody just put the word deep dive and it's true. We have to have these deep dives into why conservation is not working and not just stay at the surface. Mm -hmm. um, I think for so many years, conservation was just about uh, dealing with symptoms of, of a lot larger underlying problems. And so we this program is a lot about discussions. Um you know, we 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 want to engage all sorts of people in these discussions because we we can't. If if conservation is to be inclusive, then we are going to define conservation together. We all need to define conservation together. Kenyans need to come together and decide what is this conservation thing and what do we want it to actually be and achieve. Um, so we've started that with our university symposiums and we've had we've had two symposia so far. We had one one last year and a five day one this year. I don't know if you can call that a symposia, but it was something like a symposium. Yes. Really well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so we 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 have that we also have an instagram page please head on over to instagram and please like our beyond boundaries ke page which is really about telling stories about our conservation out here it's about telling stories about the wildlife that live beyond the boundaries of national parks and reserves that live with us and we found that it was so important to tell this story um and for us as a team and as you know as people who live out here to tell this story because not a lot of kenyans know that 70% of our wildlife live outside of parks and reserves and that means that there has been stewardship that's been happening all along and i think when people think about that stewardship they think about words that maybe a lot of the stewards wouldn't think so for example the use of saying you know this majestic leopard or elephant or whatever animal i don't know if that's exactly how people think about wildlife living <laughs> a, a, among us yeah. so we really want people to hear these stories from the eyes of the people who have always lived alongside wildlife Absolutely. and we also want to hear we also want people to hear the stories of the people mm -hmm. living alongside the wildlife because that also humanizes people and and you know we're really refusing this idea of this fetishization if that's a word of it is now <laughs> <laughs> of of people who wear traditional clothes and and live alongside wildlife i think they are either treated as these hallowed custodians to be feared or they're treated as other things to be photographed and we want to reclaim that dignity mm -hmm. and we want them you know them you to see them um as people as as who they are um and the last piece of course is this so as many discussions as we can have or as many discussions as you'd like us to have <laughs> on all of these topics that underpin conservation so um you know we'd love to hear what you'd really be very interested in i mean we've covered education gender race age place dress voice uh, <laughs> tourism <laughs> we've covered so many things um but you know it would be wonderful if this clarifications that you might have that you might want um you know to hear that to hear about that there's a couple of questions um sorry you might have to scroll up yeah. for me there's a question from Nicole we're just yeah. going to scroll up so we can read it uh okay as someone currently in graduate school in America what can i do to help start the conversation with my classmates Absolutely. I mean, we got to get the word out. I to change narratives, you have to get everyone talking. Mm -hmm. And you know, it it's you can help in so many ways about getting that word out. Try how do we stop using the word in the field? How do we get funding organizations to really not only emphasize on on people who are coming from outside to parachute in, do a bit of work and parachute back out again if you can parachute out i don't think you can <laughs> climb back out again um so it's really about having these discussions having conversations so yes speak to your classmates speak to everyone about it and just you know be brave to do it i mean we we've really we, after talking about it so much we thought let's just do it yeah. let's just get it out there but um yeah so i i think we're going to say the same thing yeah. <laughs> but i i really want to, to you know to encourage you nicole that you know this is a lot of these conversations are about systemic reform so they are about bigger things than just us yeah. but a lot of them are also about personal responsibility mm -hmm. and you know number one i'm grateful that you have even asked like what can i do to to help and what can i do to start this conversation because that is that is also the beginning of of self awareness mm -hmm. and i think self awareness is one of the most critical things when dealing with all of these issues around who conservationists are and what conservation is and should be and how how it takes place um you know a lot of people are very well meaning and they want to come and you know maybe they don't have a lot of information so they say things like i really want to come and help save africa um we're all here i don't know don't think we need so much saving <laughs> but you need saving as for us to save, save yeah it. <laughs> it's true it. we, we have some it. yes yeah. we have some agency and so do you but yeah. you know it's it's this idea of 
if you are able to be self-reflective and self-aware, yeah. you know, you're, if you're if you're ever going to come out to to help to do conservation work, even just me as an urbanite, when I walk into a community meeting, I have to think about my place. Mm-hmm. I have to think about, yeah. you know, what will be perceived, and it really does come back also to power, yeah. because there's perceived power. Maybe I, I I hold some power that I don't even know about and I'm sitting here thinking that I'm just here helping and I'm just, you know, just a normal person. But that self-awareness really, really helps to to go a long way when you're starting these conversations and please start them. Yeah. Yeah. And I was also just going to say, I think there's a place for everyone in this conversation. Wherever you're sitting in the world, I think it's important that we all have conversations within our contexts. And it's only in those really contextual places that we can start to bring out the nuances of what this looks like in different places around the world. And so, um, yeah, just again, an encouragement to start that conversation. And I think you'll be probably surprised at the interest that you get um, back from students. And there was another comment somewhere about what conservation or conservationists look, would look like in a hundred years. And well, that's where Rosan's sister, oh. Rosan should answer that question. Actually, I, I, funnily enough, <laughs> funnily enough, Sarah and I have been talking about this. We are going to tell you about this immediately after that. <laughs> um, you know, we've been talking about landscape futures. We've been talking about this and the fact that You know, so many people in the world plan 100 years, 200 years, 500 years um, in the future, even a hundred, like even, even, even a thousand years, you know, people are really thinking so far. Yes. And, and you look at their ideas now and they look completely futuristic because they were planned for the future. And we realize we do this so little when it comes to conservation when it comes to our landscapes that 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 keep us up at night that we cry about and that we we laugh about when we're 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 thinking about when we're being so hopeful about what could happen here so yes what does conservation look like in 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 a hundred years um well the hope is that it will definitely be inclusive um I don't know if, if, if we should talk about it as conservation, as an ideology or what the landscape, what we hope the landscapes will look like. Because I think, I mean, I really hope that we will have the most integrated landscapes that you've yeah. ever I- imagined, yeah. where a road development is not a threat, mm. but it's actually an opportunity to create crossings and places for wildlife and livestock and everything mm to move freely in, in this place and still still um, have its primary focus or its focus of, you know, moving something from point A to point B. Um, that there will be so much less, no, none of the inferiority complex that so often plagues Africans in conservation. Um, you know, th- there's always this feeling that we are less than, that or, you know, whatever the, the people out there have is better than what we are able to, to, to have um, and w- what we are able to do or achieve. So this unfettered pride <laughs> in ourselves, I think we're all like super great patriots um, and, and, and people who love this continent so much and this country so much um, to be able to basically express that in every way that we want to express. I mean, I hope that there will be us in the future who are there doing that in a hundred years. I also hope that we have children running running activities, um, setting the agenda. Um, I think we'll also probably not have organizations like we know them now because everyone will have such incredible such incredible sense of responsibility for their local area that will no longer need coordination institutions to move move conservation forward and i think this is definitely something that maybe we should do a separate facebook live event on and and get get everyone's opinions i think it's just such an important thing to do because narratives matter and narratives for the future matter I think for me, just very simply, in a hundred years' time, I hope we're not people are not having this conversation. Yeah. I hope they are not talking about race, power, and privilege in conservation, and how you know the, the 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 challenges we're facing in the current conservation narrative, the lack of women in leadership positions, the the 
just basically everything we've kind of discussed today that we've touched on briefly. I hope in a hundred years time, whoever sitting here is not having the same conversation. I hope it's all a thing of the past and it's all, we've moved forward really well. And um, yeah, I, I think. I want to say one more thing, which is that I hope that we have all worked ourselves out of a job. Yeah. Yes. I hope that it's not that, that, that these, the top challenges that we always deal with will not be that will not be those challenges because of the integrated landscapes because we have sought we have sorted all of these things because all of us are are conservationists that we then are not talking about the issue as a battle as a war you know fighting to save spaces and and save species i i hope that we're not doing any of that i love what Kat's just said. yeah it's in 100 years time conservation will be mainstreamed in our lives absolutely pat and we are living in harmony with biodiversity and thus organizations may be ne unnecessary absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> i think I th i'm not sure if there's any more questions but we might just wrap it up now uh, maybe one of we'll just have a closing remark um, between the three of us, but just to thank you all for joining us. It looks like there's a lot of interest in us continuing such conversations. So stay tuned. We will have a chat about that, see if we can do this more. Uh, but thank you. I really, really appreciate all of you joining us today. And uh, we hope we'll see you again really soon. And I, I have all this, I love this last question that Talash, Rasan's sister asked us, because I think there's a lot of great thought that we need to put into that. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for your questions and comments and stay tuned. We'll keep this conversation going. Um, I would love for all of you who are here to, um, at the bottom of our feed, write the topics that you would really most be interested in hearing more about because basically this was like a whistle stop tour of like everything we we thought about and we really did just say you know we want to say what what's in our hearts what 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 was what was really um on on our minds and what we thought we what what we wanted to say so you know we've covered a lot of things um and maybe we could even have different people come in yeah, to to talk about um yeah to talk about these 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 pet peeves of ours which really shouldn't be pet peeves and hopefully i mean i'm not even going to 100 years in like five years yeah. that we're not talking about a lot yeah. of these things yeah. Yeah. No, i was just going to say thank you again for joining us i think this is this has been a bold step for us but we actually feel really i think we all feel really comfortable now moving forward and i think as soon as you break the ice i think these conversations just become easier and easier and easier and so i would just encourage us all as does as does kura um, <laughs> um to keep these conversations going and reduce the intervals at which we have these conversations so have them on a daily basis in the organization that you work in have them on a daily basis at the university that you work at um, um, in the landscapes that you live in, I think the more we can have these conversations, the faster we can move forward and not have to wait 100 years to see the change we want to see. So thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.